you got a guy that tries to kill you. Mm. Eight months later, you're back. You're teaching, you're teaching the next generation of officers to go out and do their thing. Montgomery County 911, what's the address of the emergency? Today we have the honor of speaking with a remarkable individual whose journey, determination, and resiliency is the testament to the human spirit. Sergeant Kemp, thank you for being here with us today. Thank you for having me today. Yeah, thank you for making the time. And, you know, I know our community has a lot of questions. Yeah. Everybody wants to talk to you. But I have to say, in every single person that I have spoken to and that I've told that we get to have you on the podcast, the overarching feeling or just is the strength that you have had this entire time, right? From the day of the incident to now. Tell me about that. Tell me where that strength comes from. Um, it's hard to say to some extent. Um, I think a lot of it comes from this family, the law enforcement family. Um, you know, coming out of surgery that first day and having, um, you know, the people that were there for me, my, you know, my best friend, Brendan Johnston, who's a lieutenant on the department, you know, having him by my side, because I've known him for, you know, 15 plus years now, uh, outside of law enforcement, and then obviously now in the department, um, that kind of kick-started, and I knew that he was going to be there, I thought he would, you know, and then I knew that the law enforcement family would show up in droves like they did, and um, I think between that side of things, my uh, officiating as I, you know, officiate college football and high school wrestling, that family being there, my family family being there, yeah. that's where I, I drew things from. I, you know, I, I think, you know, Chief Frank was there one of the first day or second day, and, you know, I didn't want much else other than people just to be there and hang out. And that's really what I think, you know, got me through it and uh, allowed me to persevere through it because it was a constant stream of people in and out of that room just hanging out, you know, shooting the breeze and you know I, I think I had the TV on maybe two times the whole time I was down at Shock Trauma and it was for Ravens games to watch football and that, I mean that's what I wanted like that was way more fun and entertaining and and you know got me through everything much more than you know sitting there playing video games or watching TV or doing anything else so I, I drew it from the people that were there for me and in, it's obviously the people that weren't there too the, the support from the community members you know whether it was cards emails texts wh whatever the case may be um, you know, it's, it's pretty impactful when you have something happen to, you know, to you in a, you know, in the line of duty and in an environment where we're not always most loved or most liked, but the outpouring of support was just incredible. The, uh, and I love hearing you talk about, talk about this, you know, the thanks for other people, but your mindset, I mean, that, that starts somewhere else, somewhere deep. I mean, I, I mean, I'm going to tell you that, like, you know, the phone call that night is one of the, you know, few that I remember through my career, and, and they're, they're always the most terrible. And then as we were looking at what happened, right, and reviewing it, I heard your voice as you're calling out yeah. for help. Just as calm as can be. I mean, you're on the side of the road. I, what in the world are you thinking at that point? I'm, I don't know. I mean, that's, I, I knew, you know, I have vivid recollection of, of the entire night. You know, I didn't right. lose consciousness, didn't lose any So bit you of remember it. everything? Every, every single aspect of it, sight, sound, smells, everything. Uh. Um, so, you know, I think I, as many others did for, you know, what I'm sure we'll get into with going into their training, I kind of just jumped back into the, you know, this is bad. I know some no, people need to get to me quick and just, you know, I, it's like many of us, you're hearing people scream on the radio when they're not really in trouble or vice versa, scream when they are in trouble. You know, I just wanted to, I needed to, I knew I needed to get the message across. I don't know how it came out like it did. I don't know how it came out so calm and what it was, but I just knew that people had to get there. And luckily because of, you know, the plan we'd had throughout the night, I knew people were close and, right. and they were there, you know, within seconds to be there for me. But yeah. I mean, I, th I think you kept everyone else calm, to yeah. be honest. I mean, <laughs> and, and, and look, you're fantastic teammates that came to help and, yeah. and really special people. I got, we've spent some time with them and, and talked to them and, and very impacted, but they're impacted by your strength. And again, it goes back further than that. I mean, 
Why did you become a cop? So I always kind of was in the back of my head but throughout my life. I was always intrigued by it. Um, started to go the political science route coming out of uh, high school. Had a okay. great political science teacher in high school and thought I wanted to maybe go the law career. Uh, went to Virginia Tech, realized that political science in that capacity was not where I wanted yeah. to go. Right. Uh, so came back to Maryland to finish up at Towson as a business major and really started entertaining the idea again. Um, and what really was a catalyst for it was meeting Brendan through football officiating. Okay. And he was, at the time, um, a PO3 on uh, shift eight in Wheaton. Mm -hmm. So um, he was, after, you know, whether it was for my first or second year meeting him, he's like, why don't you come do a ride along? I was like, okay. So went and did, ended up doing two different ride alongs with him and realized that that kind of environment where I ended up going in Midnight's in Silver Spring, that fluid environment, not married to a desk, right. you know, uh, constantly changing, no two calls are the same. That was really what I, you know, what I wanted to do and, and where I wanted to, to be with what I was doing and how I, you know, had thought about being in law enforcement before. And that really was the, the drive to start going down the career path of being in law enforcement. Business world's loss our tremendous gain. <laughs> gain. Yeah, big time gain for us. Um, the, uh, well, also in this, in this recovery, right, mm -hmm. you know, we get to see a lot of amazing people. I, I, I tell you what, we did a tour yep. down at Walter Reed. Well, first of all, hold on, I wanna go back. I have to recognize the folks at Shock Trauma. Incredible. Incredible. It's, uh, I mean, they save, you know, 60, 70,000 lives a year, and it's, it's all they do. It's, you know, I'm biased, but best trauma center in the country. It's, you know, the founding place for trauma and the trauma system and yep. medevac uh, the coordination with Maryland State Police, you know, evolving that throughout the country. It, it's an awesome, awesome place. And you, you, you know, I've been there many times uh, in patrol going there and seeing shock trauma and seeing the true, the trauma resuscitation unit, which yep. is you know where I was admitted to first. Mm -hmm. And it's one thing to see it from that side and say, yeah. oh my God, it's, it's a well-oiled, it's organized chaos, well-oiled machine. One person goes in, as soon as they're out, the next person's in to do their job. And it's incredible to see from that side than to be the unfortunate beneficiary of yeah. the services up there, it, it's, it's just, a mind-blowing place right and 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 they have treated us so well they they took care of us better than yet they took care of you we had another yeah. officer Alana Ward years ago injured the same thing and, and it struck me how amazing they are even the 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 janitorial crew <laughs> they were on the team they yeah. they knew their job and to make sure that you get better and it's amazing but then we did this tour of Walter Reed right so we were we were we went down there to see the amazing things they're doing. How was that experience? I'm beyond blessed to have been able to get the chance to go down to Walter Reed. Uh, never served in the military. You know, my dad was in the National Guard and, and you know, my grandfather served, but I, I never was, never had any connection to the military. And having a civilian go into the military, you know, medical system is not normal. It happens, but um, on that first night on October 18th, uh, I remember, you know, I'm just on medication and all that, but I remember Brendan sitting to my side and say, turning his phone sideways and saying, sign this. I was like, what is this? He said, it's from Congressman Trone to uh, get you into Walter Reed. And that was day one, uh -huh. um, because it's a process. I equate it to uh, getting into the Naval Academy or West Point or the Air Force Academy, or the Coast Guard Academy. There's a, there's a process. You basically have to have a senator or a congressman nominate you for it. Um, and that started the process of getting me in down there and came to learn through this whole ordeal of, you know, learning about rehab and, and learning what the outside civilian world is versus what the military world is, that it was a huge, huge step forward. Um, I probably wouldn't have been in prosthetics even uh, until March or April, if I were on the outside of, like on the civilian side, and I was in um, my first set of test sockets for prosthetics on December 29th. It was in December, right? Yeah, wow. so like, what, two, three months-ish out from the wreck, which is, you know, to me, unheard of. I, I, everyone I've talked to, I, I didn't think you'd be up and walking around until 
pick a date. You know, me, me, myself too. I, I didn't think that that would be the case, but you know, it's a testament to the work that they do down there. It's unfortunate that it's that it is that good because they've had to have the practice right. from our, you know, from past um, conflicts overseas and things like that. But to be able to to be there myself as a, as a civilian getting that care has been you know, really awesome. And, and it's not the first time there have been, there have been others. Yes. Um, you know, Boston Marathon bombing victims have, yes. have gone down there. Um, some NFL players that have gotten uh, severely injured, they went to uh, over to the San Antonio to the Center for the Intrepid. But um, it's just, it's an amazing place that I had no idea. You know, I've worked here 10 plus years now, driven by Walter Reed right. hundreds of times. Right. I mean, I didn't even know until I drove down, you know, was getting motorcaded in in the ambulance that there was an emergency room and there was all, like I was just ignorant to it but it, it's it's a ridiculously great place yeah it's very historical and, and 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 again the it's multifaceted yeah like we were the we got to see we got to see the shoot the shooting range right yeah the the uh, and which is part of your therapy yep um, we also saw a lot around the mental health aspect of yes it, right so that, that's, sorry, that's... I knew where I knew that you were. Look, we don't have as much, we don't, we don't have as much, sort of caps the expert at this stuff. Yeah. We'll yeah. try and keep up with him. <laughs> um, well, but I knew you were going somewhere. Yes, yeah, so I, I just, so one of the things when we spoke, right, obviously the strength, the resiliency, but there are a lot of people in our community who may be dealing with something right yeah. now, right? It might be something small, it might be something large and traumatic to them and your mindset and you've gone back to you've said mindset you've said your your mindset your plan right is there any advice that you can give to people in our community who are dealing with something right now that they may think I'm not going to get through this yeah I mean I think for me um, two different things really stood out one is setting realistic uh, and attainable small goals mm -hmm. uh, for myself, which is something I did start in, starting in shock trauma. Um, really, the first one was being able to get out of the hospital bed into a wheelchair. Uh, and then that first day I had some, the first day that that happened, I had some great nurses. I mean, the, all the nurses were phenomenal there, but um, one in particular that was the charge nurse and took her time off the floor, took me outside, got to go outside, you know, for the first time in whatever it was, a couple weeks. Um, so then my next little intermittent goal was to be able to go out by myself with just my family and friends um, and then to be able to, you know, do a little more in physical therapy to have some upper body strength that obviously, you know, you atrophy when you're laying in bed for weeks and months at a time. Um, so just setting those little intermittent goals and some of them admittedly got blown out of the water, like getting in prosthetics in December, like yes. I, I did, that was nowhere on my radar. And then that sign, it kind of set up, sets up some you know, goals where you may not meet because you're like, well, you're moving along so, you know, so well that, all right, well, I think I'll be up and doing this, that, and the other in this amount of time. And just keeping them realistic, though, mm -hmm. and not, you know, if those goals aren't met, not dwelling on that, but, you know, using it as motivation to figure out when they can get met or how they can get met and how you can continue to move forward. And then my other biggest thing that I've, I've told to a lot of people, you know, I talked to my, my family about it and certainly all the you know the people that have been there supporting me is it's very easy to dwell on the negatives um, there is certainly a time you know we talk about mental health and and people that are experiencing problems you can't suppress anger or the you know negative emotion or frustration or sadness or whatever that, that that's got to come out I mean we're, yeah. we're human and right. I don't think it you know gets we are doing a good job as a department bringing it out more within our officers with a lot of the training at the academy and things like that but um, it's something that's not easy for all of us to do so there's there's a time to have those negative or or difficult emotions but if you dwell on them and you keep them in the forefront it, it does no good you have to you know you have to move forward with the positives and for me it's i was alive right i had no you know injuries to my upper body nothing to my head mm -hmm. no TBI, nothing like that, which is a, a godsend. Um, and I was gonna eventually go to Walter Reed and get the rehab there and I would be up and walking again. And as I stubbornly, stupidly, whatever you wanna call it, you know, with my attitude said, you know, I wanted to be back. You know, I said it very early on, very, very early on to, to Chief Jones, like I wanted to be back. I'd be back on the road, I'd be back on the football field. Um, and just having that in mind, it's, it's so much easier to think about those positive things, all the good stuff that 
has happened through a really terrible situation than to focus on the negative emotions that exist. Are, are we back on the football field? Not back on the football field yet. Um, yeah, in the replay booth. In the replay booth. So I'm doing. Uh, oh, I'm doing, okay. Yeah. Right. <laughs> in, now, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I've seen some calls this season <laughs> so far. Like you're not in the ACC call oh, in I, the ACC call my, center. I, I'm. I, I may have been once this year, oh, but I'm not okay. not for uh, any of okay. uh, any interesting situations. But I'm up in the replay booth, okay. um, which is a very different experience. It's it's not where I want to be. I want to be back on the field. Not your, you have a different goal. Yep, but I do. This is where like you are right games? now. So this past week, I was at William and Mary. William and Mary played Campbell. Okay. Um, the week, uh, two weeks before that, I was with my old crew of of guys that uh, we were together for a bunch of years. I was at Stony Brook. Okay. Uh, they played Villanova. This week, I'm here local at Georgetown, uh, so um, doing a little bit in that. It's, it's the Coastal Athletic Association, the okay. Ivy League, and the Patriot League um, that I'm a part of, and we do fall under the umbrella of the ACC. Okay. But uh, yeah, it's not. It's oh, I didn't know that. I'm sorry. I yeah. Oh, no, <laughs> we do. We, we actually do. It's that's. It was funny that you say that. So we we do fall under their umbrella, okay. but um, it's not where I want to be. I, I love being back with the guys and back involved in football it's very different totally different from being on the field you're looking you've, if you think it's just somebody up there looking at a screen and making a decision i've learned very quickly that that's not what it is it's constant talking constant oh, yeah. analyzing the game looking at different things um but the the main reason i'm not back on the field is just working through some prosthetic issues uh, i can run i do run and i have blades that i use uh for like actual running type stuff I have the setup that I have normal to which is what I'll wear when I you know am back uh, here on the road okay. and things like that but then there's going to be a third setup uh, that's a more football setup more for like athletic movements and walking walk to run more routinely and things like that so we're just working out some kinks with that trying to get it perfected so that I can get back on the field and you know I'd hope that it would be this year I think physically uh, you know and everything else I could have been it's just working through some of those other issues that hasn't gone exactly to my timeline but again I'm I'm still involved in football and my assigners and the, the different conferences is still wanted to keep me in the fold and to still be in the replay booth while I'm out on the field is, is pretty cool I I, That's I cool. listen to you and it's just <laughs> like your drive and your stamina is just it's inspiring <laughs> right I'm, I'm I, look I'm I'm going to lobby that you're uh, in the, we, we got a 12 team national championship. I, I want you in that replay booth. We're going to lobby, <laughs> we're going to lobby for that because I want someone with a mind that can go through everything that you've gone through and be so damn positive. Um, I, 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 I want you in that booth. I think I got a little bit to, to go before I can uh, right. get, get up I'm to just, that level. I'm just lobbying because I already, look, you're in uniform, man. You're, you're doing your thing as a yeah. cop, right? What have you been up to? What have I been up to? Working? Yeah. So uh, came back in a official light duty capacity at the end of June, okay. uh, which is when we taught our uh, recruit SFST week, the Standard S Field Sobriety so you're, Test Week. You're, you're teaching at the academy. Yep. I was, te I was teaching at the academy starting at the end of June, and that was really my goal. I really I wanted to – it killed me that I wasn't I'm so back. sorry to interrupt you, but – you keep saying that was my goal. You, I, I think it's so important for our, our viewers, our community to understand you're, you're so goal oriented. And, and you've yeah. been like this, I know from the times <laughs> that this has been a lifelong thing, that you have been very goal oriented and that mindset yeah. has just continued. And I'm so sorry to interrupt no, it's you, fine. but it's just my goal is this, my goal is that. I think it's so important to understand your mindset. It's incredible. Yeah, I mean, and it is like that. There are many other things that I fly by the seat of my pants for or you know just mm -hmm. go and wing it and things like that but I, I do think it is important to to have whether it's personal or career or, or whatever goals they are it's something you need to Absolutely. you need to have a plan to some extent yeah, yeah. Um, and and you're back at the work doing doing what you were doing before you're trying to keep this vision zero thing yep right um you got a guy that tries to kill you mm -hmm. eight months later eight months you're back you're teaching, you're teaching the next generation of officers to go out and do their thing, as an example. That's got, yeah. How are our rookies doing? Are they absorbing they, it? They, it was a really good uh, two weeks, and you know it was. Crash happened October 18th, and uh, DUI week was supposed to be right 
at the end of October, beginning of November. So, you know, I, I missed out on that teaching, which stinks because I've taught every class since uh, session 64. Okay. Um, I, every class I've taught the DUI week too. So to miss one is sucks because I have a group out there that I don't, they know who me are, who I am, they know who I am, but I don't know who they are. Yeah. Um, so I really wanted to get back to in the classroom. And that was something that was easy to do physically, right? Being able just to stand up. Uh, at the time I was still walking a little bit with a cane, um, but it was something that certainly my physical therapist and the doctors at Walter Reed said, yeah, that's, that's easily done. So did the, um, it was a week, a week off for 4th of July and then the following week in the second week in July taught the recruits for the SFST weeks, and then I've really just been back in the office doing the admin side of things. There's obviously, you know, my team picked up for me where I wasn't there uh, in the last year, mm -hmm. but uh, there's certainly, you know, I'm pretty OCD about some things and how no. I do stats. No, not at all, right? It's a shocker. <laughs> um, but, you know, I just wanted, I had, there was plenty that I had to do to, to make sure that we were getting back on the right path. Some you know, initiatives and programs that I wanted to do with the department to, again, talk about Vision Zero and, and other traffic, just make our roadways safer and some training programs for the department that I have uh, tried to push through and get implemented. And um, then once I've really got into the thick of things now, it's, you know, just being there for my team. Well, I'm not out on the road with them, mm -hmm. right. you know, being there in the office when they start the shift until right. they're getting out and ready to go and then get them out on the road and I go back to well, home for the day. I'm sure you have some other goals out uh, past <laughs> that. So, well, yeah. uh, I, I'm excited to see. Look, this isn't, we, well, I'm not concluding. Hold on. I'm not, I'm not letting them off the hook. <laughs> I was now. like, hold on, I have more. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> concluding anything, but I, I, I will, we were talking before this. We're going to yep. talk with you a ton. Um, but the, uh, uh, the, again, just the, the fact that, that, you're back in uniform doing your thing. It's so be it's so be so easy to call it a day. Now you see a bunch of people, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and people know your story. What's the weirdest question you've been asked so far? Weirdest question. Um, I don't know if there's any real weird questions. I no. get a lot. I get a lot of the were you in the military? Which right. you know it's you know it's it's tough. I get a lot of thank you for your service type of thing, and I'm you know they're more gearing that towards the military side of things. So you know I, I'm yeah, I, but I, I'm going to tell you there. Look, there's a there's a silent majority of our community that that loves their police. Certainly, and so I know oh, they, yeah. I know they mean it, and especially again a, a, a guy like you that's that's uh, doing their thing still. Yeah. So I I think maybe seeing you know little kids sometimes go by, and and I make the joke to some of my friends' kids, and I say you know I joke and say robot legs because it's a the prosthetics pretty crazy in advance with technology and stuff but to be sitting for waiting for an elevator seeing kids say oh, look he's got robot legs it's right. like that's that's funny like the parents are appalled like yeah. stop don't say right. it. It's, it doesn't bother me one bit I kind of think it's funny because sure. it's, it's what it is like it's uh, they're the advancements that exist because of the trauma that we've had in the past it's, right. it's a cool thing but yeah I haven't gotten too many off the wall okay crazy uh crazy statements or anything like okay. that yeah well that's good I'd like the robot the robot thing's cool I could see yeah. myself as a little kid <laughs> yeah. being like oh wow all right your turn no I just <laughs> yeah talking about Walter Reed and, and you had mentioned that one of the things that you liked so much about being there was that their goal mm -hmm. was to get you to be wherever it is you wanted to be yeah and I think that's you know an amazing thing to have ingrained in your head it at is the very beginning and you know everybody's goals there are different you get yeah. um, so there's Walter Reed National Military Medical Center and then the MATSI the Military Advanced Training Center is where really all the amputees or multi-trauma or some TBIs things like that that's where they go so that's the MATSI is where I am and I, I just remember the first day um, well the first day was the seventh and that was like a Thursday I think so when I got in on Monday it was over the weekend I had a PT eval and they were like oh, no inpatient PT for you like it's time to go down to the mat which was good for me I was like thank you that's kind of why I'm here right mm -hmm. so I was happy to hear that that was the plan but meeting the first day with uh, my physical therapist Lisa and just kind of laying it out like not only the history obviously she knew what was going on but and what had happened but laying out my personal history with what I did, what I was involved in, what I like to do on the side, outside of work, you know, walking the dog, taking the dog for hikes, you know, doing football, doing wrestling, that kind of stuff. It was, it is, it was very focused to what you want to do. 
again, not everybody's like that. They may get somebody that's at the end of their military career, you know, 40, 50 years old that just wants to be able to walk around the house right. and, you know, do that and, and be okay with being in a wheelchair for a portion of the day. I'm not. Like, I want to be up and moving and not in a wheelchair, period, until whatever point down the road, hopefully, you know, 30, 40, whatever years down the road that I have to be. But, um, yeah, it's, it's very personalized treatment mm -hmm. and, you know, working towards those goals. And even today, a couple hours ago at PT, it's just like, okay, what are you still having, what are you still having trouble with? Like, what can we work on today to, to work through whatever issues still exist? Now, how many days a week are you going to therapy? So right now I'm down to three days a week. Okay. So it was, oh, wow. uh, it started out in, when I got down there on December 7th, five days a week, started with physical therapy, occupational therapy, and then usually some other workouts in there too. Um, Wednesdays, adding in thing like, things like shooting at the, uh, the FATS, the firearm training simulator, which was awesome. Mm -hmm. um, and as it's kind of progressed and as I got into the blades and running in the blades and more comfortable walking around, ditching the cane and walking normally, we've been able to taper it down. So it's not, uh, there's, you know, more limited on what I have to work with, work for to be totally functional in everyday life, which is, it's a positive thing. I mean, again, a year and a week out and I'm getting ready to cut down to, you know, one day a week of PT here pretty soon is, uh, is a pretty cool thing. Yeah, it's incredible. Yeah. Now, this week, you, my understanding is you're working on some legislature, right? Yeah, we had a meeting uh, earlier this week with the uh, Maryland State Attorneys Association to discuss the legislation changes that we tried to get through last year. Um, they, at really probably no fault except ours, because the crash happened October 18th, and the ideas really didn't get formulated until then, even in, in their infancy. Right. So. We were late to the game last year mm -hmm. with presenting it. And I was fortunate enough last year to be able to go down and testify in front of the House and Senate and, and speak on the proposed legislation changes. But due to it being late in the season, or in the legislative season, and then obviously things like the Key Bridge collapse, it put a huge wrinkle into everything, right. it didn't get through. Um, and so we got on the ball early this year. We pre-filed uh, mm -hmm. some of these uh, bills to try to um, get them through with uh, people like Delegate Wims, who's been a huge supporter of it. And now we're kind of in the process of getting sponsors for the bill from around the state and reaching out to those other groups where we had some, um, who may have had questions in, uh, about the bill last year, just so we can clear everything up and have the best chance to get it to go forward for, for this legislative session once it opens. Now can you, sorry. You were gonna ask the sorry. same thing I was gonna <laughs> ask, no, go, go ahead. ahead. Go no, ahead. no, 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 I already knew what you were gonna ask, go ahead. Can you tell us a little bit about what is in the bill? Yeah, so there's two, the proposal is two separate bills. So there's one bill that deals with uh, the criminal offense of reckless endangerment. Mm -hmm. So uh, right now, creating a substantial risk of, of death or serious bodily injury, reckless endangerment. Um, there's an exception to that that says, except when it involves a vehicle. It, the legal language is a little different, but you can't, have, you can't have reckless endangerment if it involves a vehicle. We have had Legislators, uh, politicians, um, researchers go back through and figure out why, why in the world that existed. Right. We've kind of find, found the person that uh, got it that way for their own agenda in the past, back I think it was in the 70s or 80s, and there's really no logic to it. So hopefully we can get that removed. And that, again, will, the purpose of that is to, when we have these driving actions like the months prior to the crash, not mm -hmm. dealing with my specific incident that mm -hmm. night of the 18th, we have another tool in our tool belt to say that those actions, while they are driving and while they're a traffic offense, they also rise to a different level of a criminal offense too. It's yes. something that can get someone in front of a judge for that type of behavior. Yes. So then there's the second aspect, which is a traffic bill in effect. So um, it would, amend negligent driving and reckless driving and aggressive driving. So the biggest change hopefully will be reckless driving, um, kind of mirroring some other states um, where it is a, it would be a must appear offense, it would be an incarcerable offense mm -hmm. um, for the first time. Mm -hmm. And um, the probably contention, not contention, but the discussion there is whether or not there we need, we will have a speed limit threshold like some other states that are nearby. Mm -hmm. um, but having that ability to have speed in and of itself be reckless, which right now is not. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've pulled people over, I'm sure in your career, and say, oh, I was going, 
you got me at 90 and a 55, well, right. I'm not going to jail, right? And the answer is no, because no. we're not in Virginia. Right. And that's, you know, I'm not saying that everybody needs to or that Virginia's no. doing things the right way or the wrong way. But, but it's a tool in the belt yeah. for us to be able to impact like hey, you've been on enough, we've all been on enough fatal accidents. Yeah. What kills? Speed. Yep. Um, and then the rest of what you're going after. Yeah. So real. yeah. So that'll be the reckless driving portion. So making that um, the higher kind of thing you have is the DUI, DWI tiers. It would be the negligent and reckless, negligent driving, reckless driving tiers. Negligent driving also would be a, a must appear offense and potentially incarcerable, but it would be a much lower. Um, lower threshold there. And then uh, kind of tweaking the aggressive driving bill uh, or the aggressive driving statute, um, whereas now you need um, multiple driving actions over a continuous period of time. Mm -hmm. And it's, 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 it's convoluted to say the least. Like yeah. you gotta look back in the fine schedule and say, okay, did they do this? Oh, well, no, this one doesn't count. So trying to make it a little easier, adding some of those bad aggressive driving behaviors to the list that reaches that threshold and then for the aggressive driving side, first time would just be a higher maximum fine of $1,000 instead of $500. But if there was a second uh, instance of aggressive driving, it would trigger a must appear for them. So again, trying to, and, and the goal of these isn't to incarcerate everybody it's or- It seems like intervention. It is, yeah. and that's, uh, that's what we need for a lot of these. I mean, yeah. how many people have we all made traffic stops on in our career? And you go through e-ticks and you look and it's you know 28 stops and everyone is, speed and every single one of those is 20 and over and there's warnings mixed in there and warning after warning it does no good and by having at least the tool in our tool belt to get them in front of a mm -hmm. judge without just paying a fine and being right. done with it then maybe the judge can do something a little more than than we to can help curb so. the behavior yeah. yeah absolutely i mean it's even worse now because they've got we've got speed cameras everywhere yeah so you hit a speed camera in montgomery county you get ding okay I'm just gonna pay the fine and call it a day. Yep. Doesn't, I mean, you would hope it would change the behavior, but what we know is, what we see, is it's, it's not in all cases. Yeah. So we gotta make it safer. And you know, it took us, we covered uh, just a, a few weeks ago, unfortunately, yep. that, that they finally closed the loophole. Exactly. In uh, Noah's Law, yep. after how many years? I wanna say it was eight, not? Nine years, yeah. Nine years. Yeah. Nine years to from, finally. Yeah, from his incident. Uh, yeah. To do something that absolutely made sense. Yeah. I, I'm hoping that when you are, and we've got some good folks that are in the, the, the legislative bodies. We do. Uh, and that are trying to do the right thing. And, I, and my hope is that uh, through all of your efforts, through our efforts, you know, when you sit down and talk with them and say, come on, man. Yeah. Right? Because that, that's what it is. This just makes sense. It does, and, and it's a great parallel if you go back to Noah's Law, and, and it's unfortunate, but it seems like something bad has to happen a lot of time for a lot of these changes yeah. to occur. Right. And um, again, I, I'm all about through all this, whether it's you know using my experience to get someone else through a difficult time, get someone else into Walter Reed that wouldn't have been eligible, you know, in this case, prevent someone else from being seriously hurt. It's, that's a win if we can do that. And I think that's just the goal is to make the roadway safer. I mean, that's what I've dedicated the majority of my career to doing with traffic stuff and, and obviously have a passion for it. And yeah, I think the support has been great from every level, whether it's the county council all the way up to, you know, to Governor Moore. Um, it's, there's support all around for, for me, for my situation, for law enforcement in general to curb these behaviors. Awesome. So, Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> so I know we're both we're both fighting over asking you I questions. Know, is, this, is this this the greatest? <laughs> Pat's over here like, all right, seriously, you guys professionals? Yeah, What's going on? Go ahead. Sorry, sorry. So the last thing that I want to ask you is knowing that we have officers who are watching this, mm -hmm. right? Is there anything that you want to say to them? I mean, there's a lot to say. It's yeah. uh, and it's something that I you know, my close knit group of of friends and and I think I'd be remiss if I didn't, you know, mention the few that kind of in the order, whether it's from that night itself and, you know, uh, Matt Durr, Martinez, Nikki Seymour, um, Oskayan from Gaithersburg City, you know, those ones that were right there in the thick of it, um, putting the tourniquets on, 
um, flying with me to, to shock trauma to making sure I was okay and getting my family notified to the people like and I've you know I've because I'm stubborn and difficult you know I've wanted to see the video and I've seen all of it with all the different things and and seeing the reactions of other people I talked to him the other night like Captain Brown about it being there and <laughs> that support was it's their job but it's easy to say that until you're faced with something you know like that's with somebody that you know and I, I knew all those people pretty well um, yeah. before that and then going up for the ones that were at shock drama whether it was uh, Brendan uh, Al Dzinkowski mm -hmm. uh, Mike Polksa yeah. uh, those three and their uh, their significant others being there for me um, you know they were as uh, Cindy from Shock Trauma, who again we talked about them be just being so good and right. everything they did. Um, she called them like the Three Stooges. Um, yep, the th that's <laughs> accurate, especially for Polka. Yeah. <laughs> who again? We already talked. Yeah. Just just so he knows, this is verification. Yes. He's going to receive an order to be sitting on the couch. I I, I have no doubt that he will. Yes. <laughs> and I told him that earlier. Right. But uh, you know the three of them and and their families and kind of spearheading and and leading that whole i mean you, you know from being there you saw how it was it was, it was organized chaos being up there and, yeah. and allowing people in and where you i didn't even know what was going on people where people had to be before they could come up to the next place oh, where they yeah. could be before they could get into the room yeah. so baltimore city police great yep. job helping us out incredible Terrific. um and then just you know every you can't mention everybody else but like it's it's the entire department and I, I i do what i do think is really important to recognize is you know you kind of expect it from the people that you work with the people that you really are close to the people that you know a lot but what was really apparent to me is not just from the the rank and file the po the, the supervisors my my true co-workers not that we're not co-workers but the immediately the support from the command level from then Chief Jones, uh, through the assistant chiefs, and you as well. It just that support was awesome, and it's something that, as a PO and even as a sergeant, you don't see that a whole lot. You know, you usually when you see command, it's like, uh oh, uh -oh. like here's uh, <laughs> Chief Frank's coming in. What's what's going on? A and that's not fair. And mm -hmm. especially when something like this happens, and all that support comes from the top, it filters down and just makes things, you know. It, it ties everything together and was just kind of the backbone of all the support. And I, I can't thank the whole command staff, every bit of command staff from it, again, from Chief Jones and now Chief Yamada, you know, down. Um, it's been incredible there. And just, yeah, all the, I mean, it's thank you. It's thank you to the people that were there that spent the nights at, uh, at Shock Trauma with me, that came in the room and sat for hours and hours. Um, it's the, you know, people that I met through this. Um, some of them will understand because they've, you know, used this phrase to me. But you know, the people that I didn't realize I needed in my life, that I needed in my life and need in my life, that have come out and have, you know, been by my side through it. It's, it's just, it's thank you, and it's, you know, um, and it's not just for me. It's from my family as well because you know, there's been times when she may get mad when she sees it, but my mom, you know, has not always been a fan of me choosing this career path. You know, sure. she had a a different view in mind for, sure. for what she wanted me to do. And, and I get that, that's, that's how parents are. But I think the support that has been there has changed that mindset yeah. completely for her. That this is, it's, it's a real thing. It's the, the support network that we have is, is huge. And it's been, take me out of the equation, it's been a godsend for them to be able to have that support network too. And the friends that were my friends are my friends that are now checking in on them as, as much as I get hey how are you it's hey how's your mom and dad hey what are they doing how's how's you know what's going on they so. just got a, a lot of new sons and daughters <laughs> yeah they did yeah. <laughs> so well I mean look we're a family uh, yeah bumps bruises hugs everything that's what law enforcement does we're a family I, I got to tell you the thanks alone is just seeing you do your thing now I mean th th I think that's all any of us want to see is, is see you happy and uh, see you doing whatever it is you want to do. And I, I, I'm looking, I'm really looking forward to having you on the couch some more. We'll get you loosen up a little bit more. <laughs> we'll get you impulse. Actually, oh, we'll, yeah. put the, we'll put you guys all in here as we'll, we'll get, we'll, it'll be four stages then, but 
three stooges. We'll get you all in here. We'll have oh, some boy. fun. We'll have some fun one day. That would be interesting. Because I, I gotta, I gotta beat, uh, I gotta beat some people up about drones. I'm still, <laughs> still waiting for the drone that drops the hot dogs to. Never mind. It's a no. whole, it's a whole batch. We'll save that for another episode. Okay, wait. I have one more question. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry. Just no, one sorry. question. Just one. one that's more. it. No, I probably no, have a lot. Yeah, you have more. That's fine. It's, okay. it's fair. Like she said, it's fair game. We're, we're I, well, I just knowing that you are so goal oriented. Mm -hmm. What's next? Ooh, good. Next is uh, getting back on the road. Uh, I I will be the next time I log in and the next time I you know get in a in my in a cruiser in my cruiser. Hopefully in the next few weeks. To be honest, um, just again some stuff we were talking about before. Just some logistical issues with you know uh, making sure I'm good with driving. Uh, not making sure I'm good. I'm, I'm given the blessing to drive, but right. just making right. sure I can get my car outfitted for it. Uh, I can't wait to get on and log in back as Nine Whiskey 10 uh, in CAD and get on the radio and start making traffic stops and, you know, making the roadway safe again and locking up the people that make the unfortunate decision to drink and drive. Right. Um, that's what I'm going to get back to do. And so getting back on the road, um, running our holiday task force that starts in uh, less than a month now, November 20th, I think is our first day for that. Okay. Um, so we'll be getting names, I'll be getting names tomorrow uh, from all the districts for who's going to come up and help participate with that. But being able to run that and, you know, stand up there that night before Thanksgiving and do the, um, you know, the presentation and have Mad there, like just getting back to those things that I, yeah. everything I did before, like I, I have that passion I really do for traffic enforcement. It's what I've dedicated the whole my whole career too, and it starts off thanks to, you know, my sergeant who trained me, you know, Ken Musgrave, being a traffic guy, okay. and a DUI guy. It was okay. it started with that. I didn't really think I was going to be into DUIs, and then it got to FTO, and it was like, no, you're gonna. And it was like, okay, well, I'm gonna, and it's continued on. So getting back to the road, being back as Nine Whiskey Ten, and uh, and doing that work, and then kind of seeing where the next few months beyond that takes, whether it's. Um, you know, working with the uh, air support unit and doing the drone um, drone stuff as well. And then uh, I think it's kind of pretty common knowledge amongst everybody. It's the question I get all the time is, you know, you're going to take the promotional test and, and that's on my, uh, my radar too for yeah. this, uh, this winter into, into next year for, for taking that for the lieutenant. Are, awesome. are you a drone pilot? I am. You are a drone pilot? I am. Okay. We had Coquinos in here. I, what, what, was his, what was his call sign? Y'all get call sign. Do you yeah. have a call sign? Uh, with UAS 10, which I'm not, no, a, huge, not a huge fan. No, oh, no, no, no. No, they got, they had like, um. No, they're so top, have, your top gun top name. Gun. Oh, our pictures. Like oh, you mean our, our, Your names, our, your top gun name. What are you, like, We uh, don't have, so. You're not Maverick. No, I'm not. Uh, and I don't know that they have names, but they have a, oh, look, you know. I know you, like you, a, you no, so, Like, unless I'm, so I'm very new to this. I just went through the school last maybe, week. When maybe we were you, all have, oh, you, you have don't, you haven't earned your name. Yeah, I haven't earned my name. I, I, I picked a kind of have a direction that I want to go. Okay. We'll, we'll see. So okay. We'll, it's, that, that can be I don't, revealed later. Right. Yeah, well, I, I don't know about the whole name thing. Okay. I'll have to check. Yeah. I know that there's a, a different route where we have, but okay. yeah, I don't know about a name. What's, what's cooking? Well, that, I can't remember what he said his name was. I can't, uh, I can't either, but I do remember. Yeah, yeah. we're, we're going to we're we're gonna gonna have to go back in the uh, previous <laughs> episode. The right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but we'll, all right. Well, that's some fun, that's yeah. some fun ahead for you. There we go. Yeah. All right. Yeah, so. Awesome. Sergeant, thank you so much for being here with us. Yep. We look forward to having you back. We look forward to seeing everything that you're going to do. Yeah. And I know with your mindset, you will. I will. So. I appreciate you both having me here today and, it's, uh, and the community for the continued support and wanting to hear my story a year and a week after. So. Awesome. Yeah. And thank you for being here. Until next time, stay safe and stay connected.